come to worship God and we sing to his praise from Psalm 119 part 1a How blessed are those whose way is pure for in the Lord's law they do walk blessed who his testimonies keep and who with their whole heart him seek yes they do no unrighteousness but in his ways they onward press. Your precepts you commanded us with diligence to be obeyed. Oh, that my ways established were to keep the statutes you have made. Then I will not be shamed, because my eyes are fixed on all your laws. To you I will give thanks and praise out of a heart of uprightness, when I your judgments all do learn, for they are full of righteousness. Your statutes will be kept by me. Do not forsake me utterly. It's a psalm that speaks to us of how we ought to live as Christians. And this evening I'm going to speak for a while on the marks of the true believer. How do we know that we are true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ? <laughs> So let's join together and sing praise to God from Psalm 119, part 1a, and those first, those three verses. Let's join in praise to God. thanksgiving and praise into the courts of your own house. We thank you that we can draw near to you on this evening of your own day to praise you, to worship you, to glorify you. We pray for the help of the Holy Spirit that our worship might be acceptable in your sight. For we confess 
that even our best worship is inadequate to please you. But Lord God, we thank you that you have promised to give us the help of your Holy Spirit to sanctify and to cleanse our worship. And we pray that you would be pleased to receive us this evening as we come to worship you. Open our eyes that we might see wonderful things in your law. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would, you would open our minds to understand what your word is seeking to tell us. And we pray that you would bend our wills, that they might be conformed to that most perfect will of yours. So we come looking for your help, looking for your blessing, looking for your encouragement. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would be pleased to meet with us here as we come to worship. We worship you as the eternal, sovereign, holy God, the one who made all things, the one who, <coughs> the one who upholds all things, and the one <coughs> who in his own good time will bring all things to a close. You are the eternal, sovereign God, and we praise you. And we pray that as we come and we think about our blessed Lord and Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray that our hearts might be full of love for you and for him. We thank you that you sent him to be the Redeemer of your elect. And we rejoice, Heavenly Father, in the work that the Lord Jesus Christ has done on our behalf. We praise you, we praise him. We thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, who enables us to worship you in spirit and in truth. So Lord God, we come before you and we pray that you'll be pleased to do us good as we come together to worship you. Pardon our sin. We confess our sin. We sin against you day and daily in thought and word and deed. There is no health nor soundness in us. But you are the God whose property is always to have mercy. So have mercy upon us, we pray. And be pleased to enable us to glorify you in our worship this evening. Hear us, we pray. Pardon sin, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Turn with me, please, to the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel according to Matthew. Chapter 6, from the first verse. This is all a part of the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount that begins in Matthew chapter 5, where the Lord Jesus Christ gathers his disciples together and teaches them. It's important for us to realise that the Sermon on the Mount was not meant for those who are not disciples. These are words delivered to those who profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father, father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, <coughs> Sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, 
you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And when you fast, do not look gloomy as like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. <coughs> the eye of the lamp, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. <coughs> Now let's come before God in prayer once again. Let's join in prayer. <clears throat> we rejoice, Heavenly Father, in the gracious provision that you make for us. We receive so much from your hand. Forgive us that so often we take these mercies for granted as though somehow they were owed to us. We thank you for life, for a measure of health and strength. We thank you for homes and families. And we thank you for the, the pleasantness of our, our own situations. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have caused us to, uh, to be born and to live in a place where your word is known and where your gospel is being preached. And we thank you for that. We thank you for those who taught us the word, perhaps in our earliest days. We rejoice, Heavenly Father, in that gracious provision that you have made for us. But whilst we thank you for, for what you have done for us, we cannot help but think of those who do not have these same privileges. For those who are not brought up where the gospel is freely known. For those who grow up without even a portion of your word. We do thank you for those 
who make it their, their, their life's duty to translate the Word of God into other languages. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, that bit by bit, each language group throughout the world is getting portions of your Word. We pray that you would bless it and bless the endeavour of those who seek to bring the Scriptures to men and women of many nations. We think of those who suffer persecution for the cause of Christ. O oh Lord God, sustain them, strengthen them, uphold them, enable them to bear a good witness in spite of the persecution. And O oh Lord our God, we do pray that you would cause your word to prosper throughout the world. We thank you for those that have left home and family and have gone to spread the unsearchable riches of Christ to the, utter, to the uttermost parts of the earth. We pray that you would bless their labours. We pray especially for those who labour in difficult parts and perhaps labour for many years and see no visible results. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that the results are not for them but for you and we pray that you would encourage them in knowing that they are being faithful to the commission that you have given to them so lord god we we commit the preaching of your word to you here and throughout the whole world this day may men and women and boys and girls and young people be brought to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and may your own people be built up in their most holy faith. We remember our own young people at camps and we thank you for the camps and we thank you for, for all the people who have, uh, who have passed through the camps in recent years and we, we thank you for all that they have learned. We know that many come to faith through these camps and we pray that you will bless the camps going on at the moment and we ask that these young people might come to know the Lord so that early in life they might know Christ and serve him. So hear us we pray, be pleased to pardon our sin. We ask it in Jesus name, Amen. <clears throat> We again read the scriptures, Philippians chapter 2 and verses 1 to 18. Paul's letter to the church in Philippi and the second chapter. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy <clears throat> by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, <clears throat> taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven 
and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore my beloved as you have always obeyed so now not only as in my presence but much more in my absence work out your own salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labour in vain, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Amen. And we give thanks to God for these public readings of his infallible and inerrant word. We again sing this time from Psalm 19. Psalm 19, the A version of the psalm, verses 5 to 9. The Lord's most perfect law restores the soul that dies. His testimony pure will make the simple wise. The precepts of the Lord are right and fill the heart with great delight. The Lord's commands are clear and give light to the eyes. The Lord's fear, it is clean and evermore endures. The judgments of the Lord express his truth and perfect righteousness. They're more to be desired than stores of finest gold, than honey from the comb, more sweetness far they hold. With warnings they your servant guard in keeping them his great reward. His errors, who can know, cleanse me from hidden stain, keep me from willful sins, may they not o'er me reign, and upright then I will appear and be from great transgression clear. Let all the words I speak and all my thoughts within come up before your sight and your approval win. For you, O Lord, will unto me my rock and my redeemer be. So we sing these verses, Psalm 19a, 5 to 9. Let's join together in praise to God. <clears throat> Lord's was perfect Lord.
Now this evening we're going to look at another psalm. We considered Psalm 33 this morning. And this evening I want to look with you at Psalm 119. Not the whole thing. We're going to look at, if you have your Bibles, then if you have them open at verse 57. And we will be looking at the verses 57 to 64, the ones that we'll be singing at the close of our worship. And although, like the rest of Psalm 119, there is a focus in this section on the Word of God, but this section here shines a light on the application of the Word of God, particularly as it relates to the life of the professing child of God. Indeed, this psalm could well be entitled The Marks of the Godly Man or Woman, The Marks of the Godly Believer. Now we're going to look at seven marks. Now each, each of these seven points will not be as long as the, each of the three points this morning. <clears throat> seven marks of a true believer. The first mark is that his happiness is found in God. Verse 57, the psalmist says, You are my portion, O Lord. You are my portion, O Lord. You see, the true believer knows that God is his portion or his delight, both in this life and the life to come. And sometimes we need to ask ourselves the question, where is it that I find my happiness? You see, the happiness of the believer is not to be found in the acquisition of things, nor yet in the attaining of preeminence or prominence or position in the world. Not that either of these things is wrong in itself. If God is pleased to give us finance, so be it. If God is pleased to give us prominence in the world, then that's for him. But these things are not to be sought as an end in themselves. The child of God should be more than satisfied with the knowledge of God and his wonderful salvation in Jesus Christ. Perhaps we don't really appreciate that as much as we should because we have so much. I think it was probably brought home more powerfully to me during the time that we spent as missionaries in Peru. I went with a friend, we, we worked in the north of the country, but we went with a friend to to a shanty town in Peru. You've probably seen shanty towns on the television. They are awful places. There are thousands of people in, in places where there are no roads, there's no, uh, there, there's no toilet facilities, there's no water, there's no electricity. Their houses are made of rush matting or cardboard. On a visit down to Lima, I went with a missionary friend to a place where he was working. He had a small group of believers meeting together. And these believers, most of them, had nothing. We talk about poor people in this country. There are no poor people in this country. These people had nothing, literally nothing. There was no social security. There was no unemployment benefit. 
They scraped together what they could by doing odd jobs for people who had a little bit more than they had. And we met this lady. She must have been in her 60s or 70s. And she had nothing, literally. And yet, her face was beaming. And she said, you know, Pastor, I'm longing to be in heaven. I long for heaven because there God will supply everything for me. That's what the psalmist says here. His happiness is found in God. She couldn't find her happiness in material possession because she had none. She couldn't find her happiness in, in position in society for she was the poorest of the poor and the lowest of the low, according to the world. But she found her happiness, her pleasure, in the salvation provided by Christ. So for the believer, his happiness is found in God. The second mark, again in verse 57, is that his rule of life is the law of God. That's what it says. You are my portion, O Lord. I have said that I would keep your words. I have said that I would keep your words. You see, for the believer, his guidance and direction in life comes from the word of God. Not from the worldly systems or sources of wisdom that characterize the rest of mankind. Every part of the life of the believer should be ordered by the teaching of the Word of God. His family life, how a husband treats his wife, how a wife treats her husband, how parents bring up their children, how children are to be obedient to their parents. Every part of family life should be directed and ordered by the Word of God. Our business life, our leisure time, how we spend our money, who he marries, every aspect of the life of a professing believer must be directed by the Word of God. God has given us instructions for every part of our lives. There is nothing that is left undealt with in the Word of God. The third mark in verse 58 is that his resources are found in God. His resources are from God. He should be a man of prayer. Look at verse 58. I entreated your favour with my whole heart. Be merciful to me according to your word. And so he prays. He prays for three things. He prays for the favour of God. He pleads that God will be merciful to him. Now, every child of God should recognize that he constantly needs the mercy of God. For even as a believer, we constantly incur the anger of, of God by our sin and disobedience. We need day and daily the mercy of God. And that's what he prays for here. He says, I entreated your favor. Be merciful to me according to your word. That's the first aspect of his praying. He prays for the favour of God. Do we sometimes think that we deserve something from God? Even as believers, do we think that perhaps God owes us something? He owes us nothing. 
but wrath and condemnation. We depend upon his favour and his mercy. But the second part of his praying is with great intensity. He says, with my whole heart. So often the prayers of believers are half-hearted and perfunctory. So unlike the prayers of our Saviour. He agonised in prayer. He spent whole nights in prayer, as you see in Luke 6, verse 12. And we ask ourselves the question, when did we last spend a night in prayer? Perhaps we should say, have we ever spent a night in prayer? The Lord Jesus Christ did. And you remember the intensity of his praying when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. That the sweat as great drops of blood fell from his forehead. We are to pray for the favour of God. We are to pray with great intensity. But there's something else here. We are to pray according to the promises of the Word of God. Be merciful to me according to your word. God is always faithful to the promises of his word. And so to base our prayers upon what he has promised is to be sure that our prayers will be answered. C.H. Spurgeon has a, a good quote when he says, The best praying man is the man who is most believingly familiar with the promises of God. After all, he says, prayer is nothing but taking God's promises to him and saying to him, do as thou hast said. Prayer is the promise utilised. A prayer, he says, which is not based on a promise, has no true foundation. We think about that. God has not promised us health. We sometimes think that he has. So much of our prayers in our prayer meetings focus attention on people's health. And it's right we should pray for that. But God hasn't promised us health. He hasn't promised us material possessions and prosperity. But what has he promised us? He's promised us forgiveness, cleansing, strength to resist the evil one. And he has promised us his continual presence. So if we pray according to his word, then he will answer our prayers. The fourth mark of the true believer is found in verses 59 and 60. I thought about my ways and turned my feet to your testimonies. I made haste and did not delay to keep your commandments. His desire is to obey the Lord. So a distinguishing mark of the believer is his desire to obey the Lord. Three things. First of all, he carefully reflects upon his own ways. He considers past sins and failures. He considers his present walk. Self-examination is always profitable for the child of God. It seems to have gone out of fashion. In the 16th century, 
the Puritans and the Covenanters laid great emphasis upon self-examination, about looking at yourself and to see where you are. We don't do that very much now, but it's a, it's a good thing to do and it's always profitable because if we don't know where we are, then we can't ask God for help to correct the things that are wrong. We don't even know the things that are wrong. So in this desire to obey the Lord, there must be a reflection upon our own ways. The second thing here is, there's no point in, in examining ourselves and then forgetting all about it and leaving it just as it is. You see, the second point here is that he changes his behavior and attitudes when required. You see, if the Word of God convicts us of our sin, and if the Holy Spirit shows us what we are, where we fail, what we do wrong, then we are duty-bound to change that behavior, <clears throat> to change those attitudes. And we may have had those attitudes for years and years, but we are to change them according to God's Word. His desire is to obey the Lord. And the third thing is, his obedience will be immediate. That's what he says. I made haste and did not delay to keep your commandments. The child of God should never put off putting into practice what the word of God commands him to do. We may put it this way, to delay is to disobey. To delay is to disobey. I wonder how often we've sat listening to a sermon and something has got into our heart. We thought, this is right, I need to get this sorted out. Then we finish, we chat with our friends, we go home and we forget all about it. We delay to obey God's commands. Even when we read the scriptures at home, how often do we put into practice what God tells us to do with immediate effect? The fifth mark of the believer is that he is faithful in trial. Verse 61, the cause of the wicked have bound me, but I've not forgotten your law. Matthew Henry has a good quote when he says this, we must never think the worse of the ways of God for any trouble we meet with in those ways, nor fear being losers by our religion at last. When troubles and trials come to us, don't we so often complain? It's not fair. It's not right. Why should this happen to me? As though we didn't deserve it. And yet, the psalmist says that we are to be faithful in trial. There are so many examples in the Word of God that we could look at. We spoke about Job this morning. Look at so many people in the Scriptures. Look at the Apostle Paul, how he was persecuted, and yet how he continued to be faithful to God. I love the account of Paul was stoned at Lystra. They thought he was dead. They picked him up and he went several miles to the next town along. Now, if that had been you or me, we would have said, well, I'm not going back there. Stay as far away from that place as I can. But what the scripture says is this, that 
And he arose and returned to Lystra to comfort the believers. He didn't return to Lystra to be comforted because he had suffered. He returned to Lystra to comfort the believers. Being faithful in trial. <clears throat> Trials come to the believer and they come to refine him, to test him, to rebuke him, but for whatever purpose they are sent, they must never drive the believer away from the Lord. And we are always to remember that he has promised never to leave us nor forsake us. Not when we're in pain, not when we're in distress, <coughs> not when we don't know which way to turn. There are no exceptions to this promise of God. He has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. When you're happy, when you're sad, when you're upset, when you're in tears, it doesn't matter. I will never leave you nor forsake you. The sixth mark is that he will always have a thankful heart. Verse 62. At midnight I will rise to give thanks to you because of your righteous judgments. The Bible has a lot to say about thankfulness. Giving thanks to God is of such fundamental importance that the Bible mentions the failure to do so as a part of the basis for God's judgment <coughs> against mankind. Romans chapter 1 and verse 21. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful but became vain in their imagination and their foolish heart was darkened. We are to be thankful. We're to be thankful every day. We're to be thankful no matter what our circumstances are. <clears throat> I wonder if we, we've ever done as the psalmist says here, at midnight I will raise to give thanks to you. Have we ever got up in the middle of the night to worship God, to praise Him, and to give thanks? We should be thankful for temporal blessings. Life, <coughs> health, strength. The things that we read of in Matthew 6, 25 to 34. Every day we open our eyes, we should thank God for another day. I don't know whether it impacts on us all the time, but we can take not a single breath that's not given to us by God. And every day we wake up, we should praise God and thank God for his temporal blessings of life, health, strength. I sometimes wish I had more strength, but I thank God for the long life he's given me that God has been pleased to grant to me these 81 years. And I praise God for his goodness and his mercy and the strength that he gives me to enable me to continue to proclaim his word. We should be thankful for spiritual blessings especially. Salvation, union with Christ, adoption, eternal life, the indwelling spirit, everything necessary for life and for godliness. I hope we don't take these things for granted. We should never take them for granted. We should be thankful for temporal blessings, for spiritual blessings. And the next thing is a bit more difficult. We should be thankful for trials. 
James chapter 1 and verses 1 to 4. And Paul writes, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. A proper understanding of God's sovereignty and his providence in working all things together for good <coughs> to those who love him is a bedrock of thanksgiving. Such a perspective on life is also an antidote against ingratitude and complaining. We saw that in Philippians chapter 2 and verses 12 to 16. Can we be thankful for trials? Can we be thankful for the aches and pains that come to us? Can we be thankful when we don't have enough money to go around? Can we be thankful? Surely these are trials that are sent. There are trials that are permitted by the Lord. And has he not said that he will give us strength to sustain whatever comes? And then the seventh mark is that the believer will have a love and a concern for the people of God. He says in verse 63, I'm a companion of all those who fear you and of those who keep your precepts. We should love the people of God. They may not be like us. They may not worship the way we do. They might have all sorts of strange practices. But if, if they are the people of God, then we should love them and care for them and provide for them. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32 and 33. But call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of afflictions. Partly was you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly was you became companions of them that were so used. So in Hebrews, it's saying that there were times when you were persecuted, but there were times when you stood with, with others who were persecuted because they were God's people. I want to read an extensive quote from John Gill to close. He says, I am a companion of all them that fear you, not the rich and the mighty, much less of the wicked and ungodly, but of such who had the true fear of God upon their hearts and before their eyes, who feared the Lord and his goodness and truly served and worshipped him, even all of these, whether poor or rich, of whatever condition or of whatever, whatever nation, being no respecter of persons, with these he was a partner in the blessings of the covenant, in the promises of it, in the graces of the Spirit, and in a right and meekness for that same eternal glory and happiness. He went in company with them to the house of God and joined with them in all acts of religious worship. He conversed privately with them about what God had done for the souls of him and them. He delighted in their company. He sympathized with them in their troubles and was a companion with them in their tribulation, sorrows and sufferings, as well as in their joys and comforts. And surely that should be that should be the way we live. 
the whole attitude of the child of God who seeks to demonstrate the marks of the true believer is summed up in this last verse of this section of the psalm. The earth, O Lord, is full of your mercy. Teach me your statutes. The psalmist said he would live in humble dependence upon the God of all majesty and grace in the certain knowledge that he would supply all that was needed to enable him to live as a faithful follower of the Lord. <clears throat> These are seven marks that we should see to some degree in our lives if we profess to be followers of Christ. Amen. We bring our worship to a close as we sing that section of Psalm 119. You are my portion, Lord. I've said your words I'll heed. With all my heart, your face, I sought your promised love I need. I thought about my ways to your laws turned my feet. I hurried and did not delay all your commands to keep. Though wicked men be bound, I kept your law in view. I'll rise at midnight, give you thanks for all your judgments true. I've joined those who fear you, your precepts who obey. Your steadfast love, Lord, fills the earth. Teach me your laws, I pray. We sing these verses in praise to God. <clears throat> his countenance upon you and give you peace and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. <coughs>